I'm going to take some liberties with our topic today. The, I think Tam asked me to the, talk about the role of state legislatures in representative democracy. What I'm going to try to do, uh, first of all, is to uh, build a little bit on what Tony Corrado talked about this morning um, and uh, uh, talk about some things that I think you should not teach about representative democracy and about legislatures. Then I'm going to try to put things in a little bit of a comparative perspective, uh, both comparing Congress and state legislatures, but also looking a little bit beyond our own borders uh, to talk about uh, the role of legislatures in other countries. Um, and then uh, lastly, if I have time, uh, we're going to get a little bit to the subject of public cynicism, the problem of public cynicism in relation to uh, representative democracy. So um, that's the plan. So I know you can't read this from back there, but um, uh, you've all seen something like this, right? How a bill becomes a law, some kind of a schematic. How many of you teach that? Looks like maybe about half of you. Okay, uh, so th this one is for Congress, and you can see all these uh, first reading and second reading and in referral to committee, and if it passes the first house, it goes to the second house. It's very common. Here's another one from Vermont. This one I find hard to believe. It, it gives me a headache to look at it. Uh, it looks a little bit more like a coat of arms, you know, lions rampant with spears or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's absolutely impossible. The, the type is so fine, if you saw it on a piece of paper, you wouldn't be able to read it. Um, here's still another one from Mississippi. You know, pretty simple. And you're going to have to pardon me. I'm going to be moving back and forth, so some of you are going to have to look past me. Um, and and uh, it's a pretty simple schematic that goes uh, uh, introduction in the House or Senate first reading. Reference to committee, second reading, committee hearings, report of committee, placed on the calendar, third reading, vote on final passage, and then if it passes in that house, then you go on, uh, you complete the circle. Well, many of you have, who have heard me speak before, I almost always say, this is not the important stuff about how a bill becomes a law, and I would urge you not to teach it. But I've never actually sat down and worked through with an audience what's wrong with this uh, simple drawing of what happens in the legislature, and I lost my notes here. So what I, the question I want to ask is, what's missing from this? These procedural steps, what does it leave out about the process of making a law? And uh, think back to uh, Tony's lessons of this morning. Yeah? Collaboration. Collaboration, okay. That's a good one. What else? Okay, interest groups, parties. What, what, what else did you have? Uh, constituents. Constituents, uh, oh yeah, wow. Um, the regulatory agencies, sometimes you can get uh, statements. Okay, agencies. From certain state. Okay. So uh, besides, in addition to constituents, what was that big word uh, Tony used this morning? Ideology? No. What, 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 what's the relationship between constituents and the elected officials? They represent them, right? So there's not a word about representation on that drawing, okay? Who else has something else that's missing? Okay. Okay. 
I'll just call that a why. What else? Jan? The legislator's own values and background. Okay. Values. And what's important about constituents? Influencing. Hmm? Influencing the policy. Right. Okay. So, yeah, they're trying to make things happen, but are the constituents all agreed? Mm -mm. Okay. So, disagreement is missing from this. What else? Uh, and maybe this is just conflating too much. It creates in the minds of the students that this is a very simple process that, that, that it just, it's nice and easy. It's step by step and by step. It, and as your colleague mm -hmm. Alan Rosenthal likes to say, that it's like the state rock or the state reptile or what have you, <laughs> that when it doesn't work that way, kids say, what's the matter with the uh, process? Right. So it's okay. to me. Okay, so I added confusion and disagreement uh, to the list. Okay, yeah, la one last one, Jim. Oh, I was just going to say, it's also just maybe a, a better idea of relevance to the Constitution. Uh huh. As far as a construct or a structure or a process. Okay, great. Well, I would submit to you that what you should be teaching about is not this, but this. And that's why, in a nutshell, we have put together the lessons that we have put together at NCSL uh, in the Trust for Representative Democracy, and they are exactly the same lessons that the Center on Congress teaches about Congress. In fact, the way that we came to this collaboration was that we at NCSL were doing writing on subjects like this about uh, how state legislatures worked, and we started reading what Lee Hamilton was writing, and all you had to do was take out the word Congress and put in state legislatures and what he was writing, and it was the same thing. So that was the basis on which we uh, initially got together, and it's been the basis of our collaboration ever, ever since, and uh, the Center for Civic Education uh, brings us all together uh, in that uh, process and brings their uh, enormous uh, and terrific uh, network and expertise to it. So um, I accidentally uh, uh, pushed the next button. This is a uh, painting that is on the wall of the uh, uh, Virginia Senate's uh, members lounge right off the uh, floor of the Senate. And uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the Senate in Virginia, they have local artists, the work of local artists, uh, Virginia artists. And this is one uh, painted by a, a, a young man, a 20-year-old guy out in rural Virginia. Uh, and the members chose to put this in the most prominent place in their lounge because they thought this is more like how a bill becomes a law. So it gets to the confusion, it gets to the messiness, it gets to all kinds of different things uh, going on uh, at once. So I particularly like this one. Um, then here's, uh, here's another one uh, that's kind of fun, and you'll have to put up with an advertisement on here for just a moment. <laughs> So, again, this conveys all these thousands of things going on at once. It isn't a single bill moving through the process. It's uh, multiple things at multiple points. But I'm going to first go to uh, an international comparison. And I'll be fairly brief about this. But I think it's uh, useful to divide legislatures around the world that I've observed and uh, political scientists and others have observed uh, into three categories when you look at the role that the legislature plays in uh, policy making. The first category is where they play very little role. These are the classic rubber stamp legislatures. Um, 
The legislature in China would certainly be in that category. The legislature in, in any uh, dictatorship, uh, uh, most of the Arab world until recently and arguably still in most of them, these are rubber stamp legislatures. Then there are, there's a fairly large category today in emerging democracies around the world that I would call transitional. They, ha they are moving from uh, being a rubber stamp legislature, but often they don't have uh, the political courage or the political will. Their traditions of strong executive rule or one party rule are so great that it's, it, it just takes a long time for um, the legislature to become independent. If you go back 15 or 20 years, um, the, the former uh, East European bloc countries were mostly in that category. Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, it was Czechoslovakia at the time, I guess, uh, uh, Poland, and so on. They actually have now moved from uh, that limited category to being uh, active and uh, what we call uh, having an extensive involvement in policy making. So change does occur uh, over time, but in some places it's very slow and that transition period lasts for uh, quite a while. Within the extensive involvement category, there are two basic types. There are more than that, but we'll simplify it uh, by saying that there are two of them. One we would call informed parliaments, informed legislatures, and I'll use the term parliaments and legislatures interchangeably, uh, but this is the, uh, classically the parliamentary system, uh, uh, all of the, the Westminster style, it's often called, uh, virtually all the British Commonwealth countries have it, and under the informed uh, category of extensive involvement, the majority always gets its way. If they don't get their way, they have to form a new government, they have to call a new election. So there's, there's never very much doubt as to the outcome of what happens. Uh, usually in these systems, especially ones where the prime minister is chosen uh, by the legislature, whatever the prime minister and the cabinet presents eventually gets approved. But along the way, the minority gets a very strong voice, and if the minority raises important questions that gives pause to the majority, the majority may come back and amend that legislation. Um, so, uh, but, but that's different from our second category of extensive involvement in that and the U.S. is the, the, the best example of this, one of the very few around the world, where um, the legislature is genuinely transformative. It views its role as changing what the executive has proposed. They have, haven't the slightest hesitation at doing that, and um, it's part of their self-image and what they actually do. And this is, this is typical of separation of power systems. Um, and um, uh, the, the difference between the informed uh, uh, legislatures and the transformative legislatures is that in the informed category, it's, it's still a democracy. It's an equally good democracy as the transformative but it is simply a slightly different role uh, the, the legislature plays. So uh, let me just play that out a little bit, and I, I'm not, this is a detailed uh, uh, table. I'm not gonna go over all of it in detail, but uh, I'll just take a couple of examples here. This is different stages of uh, lawmaking uh, and comparing the uh, extent of involvement across uh, three categories. So um, at the pre-introduction phase, before a bill is even uh, put into the process, in, uh, the, uh, uh, in systems with extensive involvement, there's likely to be advanced consultation 
in, um, especially on important bills that the executive wants. The executive is likely to, whether it's the governor or the president of the United States, they, or, or the prime minister uh, in a parliamentary system, they are likely to have conversations with key leaders, whether it's committee chairs or presiding officers or whatever about, do we have a chance of getting this? Is this something that goes? Would you be okay with this if we went for this idea? So even before a bill is introduced, there's consultation. Uh, under the limited systems, that consultation very seldom occurs, and if it does occur, for the most part, the advance recommendations of the uh, members of parliament are ignored, and then in the rubber stamp legislatures, there's just no consultation. So that's just one example in the committee review stage. Um, on, uh, in legislatures that are, have a very extensive involvement, there are active hearings, there are amendments proposed, uh, they have subpoena powers, uh, they can call witnesses, and they have staff to help them uh, do the investigative work that committees are good at doing. Um, in the limited category, the committees have the responsibility of doing this, and they might have some of the, uh, uh, the surface uh, characteristics of it, but in fact, they don't really exercise uh, that investigative authority and the kind of winnowing uh, work that effective committees do. And then in the rubber stamp legislatures, you're likely to find committees in name only. They do, don't do much of anything. But I think it's just really useful for us to remember, again, partly in the international context, what the common features of our, Ameri of our 51 uh, American legislatures are. Uh, the first and most fundamental is the separation of powers. Um, I do a lot of speaking to international groups, to legislators from other countries, to legislative staff, and I always find that they know a lot more about Amer than Americans do about the theory of separation of powers. Most of them have actually read Montesquieu, um, but they don't really know how it works and uh, how extensive uh, the, the notion uh, that these are separate and independent branches of, uh, of government. Um, and I think, that, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. We always talk about uh, uh, the states as laboratories of democracy. Well, it's very interesting to me that uh, at least since the end of the 18th century, no state has ever ex experimented with a parliamentary style system. They have all stuck with uh, a separation of powers system. There have been, there's, there've been some bills introduced to do it, uh, but they've never, none of them have gotten uh, uh, very far at all. So a second common feature of our legislatures is that uh, of the 51 legislatures, 50 of them are bicameral, and you all know who, I want the exception. Nebraska. Nebraska, good. Uh, somebody's here from Nebraska, right? There, all right. Yay, unicameral. Um, uh, and this one is interesting because um, the original, it went actually back in the uh, 18th century in the first two decades um, of our uh, modern constitution, uh, there were a number of the legislatures that were uh, unicameral. But by 1800, they had all switched to uh, uh, bicameral uh, state legislatures in imitation of the Congress. And for the most part, it was um, on the same basis that Congress has two chambers, that there was a base, different basis of representation. So houses of representatives tended to be uh, more based on equal representation, on a popular, uh, uh, on proportional representation. And senates had more representation from uh, communities regardless of their size. Now that wasn't consistent across every state, but in general, uh, there was that difference uh, in um, uh, the two chambers. That went away 
with um, the, the uh, one person, one vote decisions by the Supreme Court uh, in the 1960s, uh, Baker versus Carr and Reynolds v. Sims uh, being the most important decisions. And all of a sudden, that, that decision, that, that those decisions that meant that in, within each chamber, legislative districts had to be of virtually equal size, kind of did away with one of the key reasons for having a bicameral legislature. And yet, all 50 states, all 49 states, uh, 49 of the 50, have stuck with the bicameral uh, model. And I think there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is just tradition, uh, that we don't change our constitutional structures all that often, except for those states that have the uh, initiative. Um, and, but the second, and maybe the more important one, is a fundamental part of our political culture, which is a strong distrust of centralized power. It's one more way of breaking up power. We break up power between the national government and the state and local governments. We divide power between executive, legislature, and judicial. And within the legislative branch, we divide power by uh, this ongoing system of uh, two chambers. In all 50 of our states, uh, uh, we have periodic elections. Uh, this is unlike uh, systems in other countries where um, if you lose a majority in the legislature, you immediately call an election. There are regularly scheduled elections, but you can have all kinds of elections in between that uh, regular schedule in our system. In each state, it's always on the same date, every two years or every four years. Um, complicating thing is that in 45 of the states, uh, those elections are the same as the federal election dates in even numbered years, but there are five states that have uh, odd number year uh, elections for their state legislature and uh, for governor, but the point is that all the elections are on the same date and at the state level we have very, very few elections, only special elections to fill vacancies on any dates other than the ones scheduled in the state constitution. A fourth common category is the roles that leaders play. Um, in the houses of representatives in the United States uh, with only one or two exceptions, the Speaker of the House is the leader of the majority party, the ceremonial leader of the legislature, and the chief administrator of the legislature, as he is in the United States House of Representatives. So, uh, and again, that's unlike lots of uh, systems in other countries where the Speaker is often just a ceremonial leader and doesn't, and maybe has some administrative authority, but is not the leader of the majority party. In fact, the speaker may not be of the majority party in a lot of other countries. In our state senates, um, there's also usually a somebody who combines uh, the political power of being the leader of the majority party, being the chief administrator of that chamber, and being uh, may, maybe less often the ceremonial leader. The problem is that it varies from state to state what that position is. In some states, it's the lieutenant governor. In other states, it's the Senate president. Uh, still others, the president pro tem. And there are some that are like the United States Senate, uh, where it's the majority leader. So, uh, but that person usually exists. You just have to know who it is uh, in each state. Uh, one of the most important at common aspects is the committee system and the roles that uh, committees play in uh, shaping legislation. Uh, the committees are where a large portion of the work of a legislature gets done. Even in the most partisan legislatures, often the minority party can have a significant influence within the committee because it's a smaller group of people. and. Um, uh, ideas and arguments and uh, uh, reason can play a much larger role in a small committee 
than they often can in a polarized legislature where the parties are dug in and they're simply not going to accept uh, amendments from the minority. But often uh, committees are uh, remarkably collegial and work well uh, together. Another common feature um, is that uh, uh, we have a remarkably enduring and strong two-party system in this country. Of the 7,382 state legislators in the United States, only about 30 of them are elected under any party name other than Democrat or Republican. So third parties are basically uh, irrelevant in American politics except for the occasional presidential uh, election. And my last point here is the predominance of the single member district in, I don't know, it's about 95, 98, it's over 95 percent of the district, state legislative districts in the country are single member districts. So, um, with, uh, well, and um, uh, one of, the, if you combine these last two, the two party system and the single member district, one of the things that means, again, in international comparative perspective, is that in American legislatures, there's almost always a clear majority party and a clear minority party. Sometimes there are coalitions because uh, people cross party lines and there are conflicts within the party, but it's pretty rare. Um, and so uh, we usually have that uh, clear majority party and clear uh, minority party, and it makes a difference in how our legislatures work compared with uh, countries, uh, Tony was talking about Italy, where they're changing the government all the time. Well, it's in part because they've got seven or eight different parties uh, represented in the legislature, and that's common in uh, most of the world today. We are relatively rare in having a two-party system. Usually you either have a one-party system, there are quite a few of those still, uh, or you have a multi-party uh, system. Okay, here we're getting into some of the differences, and particularly structural differences, uh, among our um, state legislatures. And I'm running out of time here, aren't I, Jan? Uh, okay. Um, I, I, I'd actually take a little, like to take a little bit of time to illustrate some of these differences by calling on some of you. Would, you. would you raise your hand if you think you know your state legislature reasonably well? And what I'm interested in, do you know how many members there are? Do you know roughly what they're paid? And do you know how long they're in session? If so, raise your hand. OK, stand up, those of you who've raised your hands. And I, I, I'm not going to call on uh, all of you. Uh, let's see. Uh, OK, Vermont, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. How many members are there in the legislature? There's 150 in the General Assembly and 30 in the Senate. And the population of Vermont's about a million people? 650,000, so and I find it useful to uh, divide them into three uh, types. One would be the ones that are in blue here that are like uh, New Hampshire and uh, Vermont. Uh, they are uh, uh, quite short sessions. Uh, they uh, uh, get very low pay. We forgot to mention that in New Hampshire, the members are paid $100 a year for their service in the legislature. So it's basically a volunteer job. Um, uh, so these are uh, mostly the New England states, the uh, very uh, geographically large uh, Rocky Mountain states, but small population, uh, and then a scattering uh, through the south uh, as well in this uh, blue category that are often called citizen legislatures. The red category is mostly the largest population states. These are uh, what we call our most professionalized legislatures. They operate much more, in most instances, they operate more like the Congress than they do the other state legislatures. That, that's particularly true of, of uh, California. If you've, if you've walked the halls in, uh, of Congress in Washington, D.C., and you walk the halls in Sacramento, it's a very, very similar kind of sort of high-charged and um, uh, political and uh, high-pressure 
uh, kind of uh, atmosphere. So it, 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 it plays out in all kinds of different ways in uh, how the legislature uh, works. But there are, I, I should have said there are about, I think, 17 states in the blue category, uh, 10 states in the red category, and then the balance of the states, almost half of them, are someplace in between. Uh, Colorado that we talked about, or Connecticut, those are you know just pretty much average on everything. Uh, there are some others that are extreme in one category and low in the other, so they end up averaging out. Uh, uh, Texas would be an example of that, where uh, according to the Texas Constitution, they meet only every other year uh, for six months. Um, and uh, the members are paid $7,200 a year. And they've got these huge districts in the Senate. Senate districts in Texas are bigger than congressional districts uh, as they are in uh, California. Um, uh, so they've got very short sessions, very low pay, but they've got huge staffs uh, to try to help them deal with those problems of uh, constituent service. So um, th this hybrid category that's in white on this map can either be the average type of state or the one that's extreme on one end and uh, one measure and uh, uh, low on another. So um, I I'm just going to give you some very quick findings from public opinion polls about uh, uh, public cynicism. Uh, if you look at 18 to 24 year old opinion, more than half of them, half of them agree with the statement, you cr can't trust politicians because they're dishonest. Two thirds of them say my generation's voice is important but no one's listening. 90% um, uh, of them say a few big interests run the government. All they do is bicker, that's what we hear when we convene um, focus groups of young people or older people. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, 85% of the people in a public opinion poll agreed with this statement. Elected officials would help more if they stopped talking and took action on problems. Well, you know, just think about that for a moment. What does that leave out? Disagreement, deliberation, debate, negotiation, compromise. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville wouldn't believe that uh, image. Uh, so, you know, so in effect, what it's saying is the public atta attaches no value to these fundamental aspects of uh, representative democracy. Okay, um, pull out your cell phones. And uh, I'm going to have to read this to some of you uh, at the other end. I know you can't read it or you could walk up here where you can read it. But first of all, uh, if you, know, if you uh, know how to text message, everybody know how to do that? Yeah. Okay, if you know how to text message, then uh, you're, going, the, you're going to text to this number, 22333. Put that in the two column, or the two line. Two, two, three, three, three. And I'm going to give you five choices of words that you think of when you hear the word politics. Trustful. If trust, the, 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 I'll give you the five words in case you can't read from the back of the room. Trustful, power, lying, responsive, and corrupt. Okay? So the first of those words, the one that you think best describes the word politics, if it's trustful, then in the message uh, line, uh, uh, key in 286-073. If power is the word to, that comes to mind, it's 286074. That's 286074. Um, if it, whoops, sorry. Uh, if lying is the word that comes to mind for you, uh, it's the next number up, 286075. If responsive, then it's 286079. 286079 for responsive. And corrupt, 286089. 
zero. Okay. So here, here are the results. Uh, how many of you responded? I think 14 of you have, uh, have sent us text messages. And 64% of you said power. Um, uh, we're moving. We got a number 15, uh, being influenced by all the other responses, no doubt. 20% uh, of you said responsive. 13% um, said corrupt. 7% said lying, and none of you said trustful. Um, so this is, I mean, actually, that's, that 20% at responsive is uh, pretty positive. Uh, power is, um, I, I've given you two negative words here, uh, two positive words, and one that is, can be interpreted either way or maybe is just descriptive. And in fact, most of you have chosen uh, power, uh, which I would regard as uh, probably neither positive nor negative. This, by the way, is a, this is a technology you can use in your classroom. It's free. Um, have, have any of you used something like it? This is Poll Everywhere. There are others like it. Um, PollEverywhere.com, all one word. That's one word, though, not a separate word. It's Poll Everywhere. But there, there are others of them. Uh, it's free for a group of this size if you were doing it for 250 or 300 people. Uh, you'd have to pay something for it. Uh, we actually asked uh, on a national public opinion poll, we asked a question like this. I, cho I chose five out of 15 words that we uh, uh, gave to a national sample of uh, all Americans. And 67% uh, scored uh, power, very much the same as you. And again, I would say that's just a de descriptive term. But then look at this, two out of three chose corrupt, and more than half of them chose lying. Um, so, you know, holy cow, this is, this is really, really depressing, distrustful uh, view of uh, politicians, and hang on for half a second. Um, and, but then look down here at these positive words, only one in 20 chose a word like trustworthy or uh, responsive. So, um, you know, it's a very, very negative image of the politicians, of, of politics and politicians. And if we used the word politicians, it would have been worse. I said at the beginning that I was passionate about uh, uh, representative democracy. And I'm, as you can probably tell, more than a little bit of an idealist. Um, and, you know, sometimes we struggle with the idea of why do we have legislatures? What, you know, what's their, what's their mission statement? What are they all about? And I was actually, I don't know, nearly 20 years ago, I, I was in kind of a down phase. I was feeling cynical. I was feeling disappointed by what was going on in uh, legislatures in the United States. And I had an opportunity to go to Brazil to uh, work with the uh, legislature in Rio Grande do Sul, the state of Rio Grande do Sul, which is way down on the Uruguayan border in, uh, in uh, Brazil. And the first time I walked up to the uh, assembly building in Rio Grande do Sul, um, I saw this enormous sign, uh, you know, letters this high uh, that said, povo sem parlamento e povo escravo. And, Unfortunately, I don't speak Portuguese, so I had to ask, what does that mean? And the translation that I got was, people without parliament are people in chains. And I just stopped for a moment, and I thought, you know, that's why I do what I do. That's why I believe what I believe, that in these few words, it captured for me um, what, the, what legislatures are all about. In, in protecting the freedom of the people and representing their ideas and uh, keeping them from uh, being enslaved by a dominant uh, uh, executive. So uh, I will leave you with that thought. Uh, if it's of any uh, value to you, I find it to be an inspiring notion and uh, one that keeps me going. So uh, thanks very much for your time. And Jan, I apologize for going long.